everybody. How you doing? Well, that's good. You're listening to PHLY Flyers. That's right, PHLY. My name is Bill Matz. I'm your director of fun and games for the evening. Joined, as always, by Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor. Charlie, <clears throat> I said, well, that's good, but... If you are a Phillies fan today, it's not good. you might be in shambles. Well, are you in shambles well, we today? Have, we have Nick DeCristo Nick saying, DeCristo. please let's talk about something other than the Phillies. No. <laughs> what I will say is that I refuse. in my article on the game, I basically <sighs> made the point that while that game was incredibly frustrating and while I suspect most teams it would be the decisive blow essentially leading them to end their season, let's be honest. This Phillies team loses a game like that once every two weeks. It's, it, that might be an underestimate. <laughs> if there's any team that's not going to lose any momentum, it's like, I got shot yesterday. Yeah. Like, of course yeah. it didn't hurt, you know? Like, that's just it, them. It, it is actually amazing how, like, how <laughs> little memories... Number one, it's amazing how bad the memories of the, that the team is because they find ways just to forget about these games. It's also amazing how bad the memories of fans are because every one of these bad losses is the most <laughs> embarrassing, disastrous loss it's, ever. And it's like, dude, this happened four days ago. We can't even call them resilient at this point. They're just like brain damaged. No, it's literally, it, it's like the <laughs> Simpsons thing of like, he's already dead, stop shooting <laughs> yeah. it. But here we are, uh, it's 1-1. One, one. I guess, like, they went down to Atlanta and did the thing they were supposed to do, split. Yeah, of course, but they, they did but, it in the most infuriating way. Yeah, that's... Yeah, like, which is what they do. You're, that's... Like once you get the first one with Ranger on the mound, it's like, well, we got Wheeler tomorrow. We're going home up 2-0. We're closing this out Wednesday. And he was great. And he was great. It doesn't exactly work out that way. It's a little disappointing, but... Oh, well. Anyway, now on to the Flyers. Now on to our orange and black. The roster has been released, Charlie. Well, we sort of. Well, yeah, kind of, sort of. Sort of, kind of. There's some moving parts to it still. Uh, you know, uh, Rasmus Ristolainen opens up on IR, and we will but, see but about... But maybe not. Yeah, and we will see about uh, if he remains there uh, for the opener on Thursday. Andre, Brink, and Forster are all here. We will see if they remain. On Thursday, uh, it appears like Bobby Brink definitely will be yes. here. We will see if there's another move. Uh, Felix Sandstrom also opens up on the opening roster. Once again, we shall see. And there it is for all of you. Uh, the thing that stuck out most to me, and we'll get into all the players who actually um, exist. Sounds good. <laughs> but uh, something that really stuck out to me yesterday was the number of people in the replies to like the tweets from the team where we pulled that from, and even your replies, Charlie, which are my favorite thing on the internet, is are your replies. Uh, the number of people who are just like, Ryan Ellis? And yes, some of them are sarcastic, but a lot of them are not. And it just reminds me of how much, one, like there is to go before like people realize what's going on with this team like the grand yeah the, the big picture yes the diehards the people listening to this show probably have an intimate knowledge of how injured reserve and long-term injured reserve and all these things work and if a guy's career is over but he still has a contract he's not allowed to retire so he just has to be here but like in the grand scheme of things there is still so much work to go and it was just one of those reminders like this is why the flyers are fighting so hard for good pr again because they've fallen so far that a dude who played, what, two years ago? <laughs> He's on the roster, and I assume everyone knows why. They don't. Well, you know what it is, and this is the frustrating part on my side, and why I go into every year really, really trying to, like, I wouldn't say turn over a new leaf, because I think, relatively speaking, I am the most by far communicative with the fans of any of the writers that cover this team. But I go in every season, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do my best not to get frustrated with the people on social media who will bombard me with crap. And one thing I decided this year is I'm like, I can't just assume that everyone asking these questions is doing it to be a dick, that a lot of people just don't fully understand <laughs> don't know, yeah. how these contracts work. The problem is that then there are other people who are doing it to be dicks. And by the time we get to like January and February, all those people have worn me down because they just want to like they jab, jab, jab. And this Ryan Ellis stuff is a classic example because there are some people that see his name pop up on the on the opening roster graphic that the team put out. 
And they're like, Ryan Ellis, he's on injured reserve. Why isn't he on long-term reserve? Does that mean he's coming back? And they're sincerely wondering. And to be clear, if any of those people are watching the show, Ryan Ellis is never going to play an NHL game ever again. He has to be on, on injured reserve because they can't kill his contract because, understandably, the guy signed the contract. He wants to get paid, so he's not going to retire. But the Flyers... If they need to clear that space, which they actually don't this time, they're actually under the $83.5 million salary cap ceiling, even with his $6.25 million cap hit. But if they need to open up space beyond his his cap hit, they can put him on long-term major reserve. They can open up most of the allowance from there. This year, they don't have to, so that's why he's on normal injured reserve. It has nothing to do with the fact that he's close to returning. The guy still can't skate. The guy's almost certainly never going to play again. This is just something that we're just going to have to deal with. And it's very until, annoying. Uh, until that contract expires. In four and, years. And this is the thing where it's like, because I directly communicate with the fans more than anyone, people yell at me about Ryan Ellis, and it's like, guys, this is just the way it is. It's not my fault that they're paying Ryan Ellis. Also, it's really not your money. So yeah, why cares? do you care? It's Comcast's <laughs> money. This is Comcast Spectacor's money. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Uh, and just for um, in case anyone needs a further explanation, uh, the difference between IR and LTIR, the reason you wouldn't LTIR him is because the way the NHL salary cap works is every day you're under the cap, you accrue that cap space so it builds up throughout the season. Once you have a guy on long-term injured reserve and you're getting the uh, you're getting the allowance from him not counting against your cap, you no longer accrue that space. Right. So you get to the deadline and you have the amount you had when he went on LTIR rather than the amount you would have every day you're under the cap. More, more, so more or less, yeah. And, and that's the, my understanding yeah, of I it. Mean, if I'm wrong, correct. You're, you're basically right. There's like just like a few, if someone was being very, very nitpicky, there's a few ways you worded that, which isn't totally right. But on the whole, that's, that's the way it works. It's a very complicated thing. Basically, just know that right now the Flyers don't have nearly enough money wrapped up in their players to go over the $83.5 million, even with Ryan Ellis counting. So it doesn't matter. Now, if they were to trade for somebody, if they were to make some sort of maneuver, if they were to claim somebody on waivers, that might change. And it won't be difficult to just move Ryan Ellis over to long-term injury reserve because, again— Everyone knows he's, he's never, never going to play again. Okay. It's we have, over. We have that part. Never going to play it again. Just, we have now explained it. We <laughs> never have to explain it again. We will. You will. Charlie, though, never correct me again. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I guess since we're talking IR with this right. Rasmus Ristolainen thing opening up on injured reserve, uh, yes. it allows for both young defensemen. We talked to Zamula was making the team because he's not waiver exempt. Uh, but Andre's still here. Sandstrom's still here. Forster Brink. They're all here on the active roster as of this moment. My question about uh, Risto on IR is, is there some sort of, like in the NFL, you put a guy on injured reserve. It used to mean he's out for the season. Now mm -hmm. it's minimum four weeks. Right. Is there some sort of minimum he has to miss? So there is. There, okay. It's a seven-day minimum. And my understanding of it, I was actually, Briere, I got this point clarified today when we talked to Danny Briere in the uh, the Voorhees practice facility. My understanding was that the seven day counter started from the first day of the season, so that would have been yesterday when the when the rosters were finalized, and he would have to be out because he was placed on IR to start the year. He would have to be out for seven days with the clock starting yesterday. Briere claims that, and I have no reason to think that he doesn't know this because presumably this is something where like Barry Hanrahan will have called up the league office to confirm they can do it before they did it. This is, this is what happens. This is why they tend to know more than us because they have the ability to call up Bill Daly and be like, hey, can we do it this way? Briere claims that they can backdate Ristolainen's IR placement to last week when he initially got hurt, which means that in theory, and Briere said that it's still possible, in theory, Ristolainen could be pulled off IR before Thursday and actually play in Thursday's game. Now, that's, un that's unclear whether it's going to happen. Ristolainen did skate with the team today. According to Briere, he was getting checked out this morning. That was going to dictate whether he was on the ice today. He was on the ice today, so good sign. However, he only participated 
in the full practice with his teammates for about half of it. Basically, once they started getting into battle drills and scrums and whatnot, they weren't just skating around shooting. Ristolainen was off to the side with one of the coaches doing some skating work and whatnot. So there's only two more days left. If I had to guess, I would guess he doesn't play. Tortorella did seem fairly confident that he was going to go, but at this point, we're it's getting really we're getting really tight. And to me, my thing with with all these kids, you've got Zamola, you've got Andre. They both made the team. Presumably, you're going to want them to play. Why rush Risto back when this just gives you an opportunity to get a look at at least one, if not two, of the kids? So this is because my question was: Was this some sort of he's banged up to try to fudge the numbers? But it looks like he actually has something. He didn't. He did yeah. come. Uh, he was supposed to play in that. Uh, was the last the or final second pre- delay, the final, the pre-season, final pre-season, pre-season game? game. Yeah. Andre wasn't in the original lineup, yeah. and then Andre stepped in for him. So that is something. Uh, so, but this is—it's a legitimate, if not injury. He's at least hurt enough to yeah. warrant an IR trip. It's not some sort of phantom. Let's see if we can get an extra guy look, on or look. Keep Sandstrom may- an extra day. Maybe that's part of it, and okay. and I wouldn't be surprised because. We talked about this yesterday. The big thing with the Felix Sandstrom situation is waiting out the they're lightning. waiting out the lightning. And the Flyers are not the only team that is still doing this. Apparently, there are five teams with three goalies. This is all because of this Tampa Bay Lightning thing, which I think is insane because it's kind of like Tampa. If you really want Felix Sandstrom that bad, you can have him. But the Flyers clearly don't want to lose Felix Sandstrom for nothing. They are really valuing this, possibly in part because... They're worried that if they find out in early November that Carter Hart's suspended for the season, then if they've also lost Sandstrom, then suddenly you have an Urson, uh cal Peterson tandem, and you have literally no one in your AHL that is a, th- a viable third goalie for the rest of the year because you lost Sandstrom. That's really, I think, what's going on here in the grand scheme of things. However, Breer did say today that he, he expects, and this presumably is regardless of whether Risto is, is activated or not, he expects them to at least start the season with three goalies. I have Interesting. To, I have to believe that the ultimate plan here is that when the staring contest finally ends between the Lightning and everyone, that they will then wave Sandstrom and send him down because it just it doesn't make any sense to me to number one, it makes next to no sense to keep three goalies. Like because even just you can from, only dress two. Even just from a practice standpoint, you have to be constantly rotating. It's annoying. Like the coaches don't like it because it's hard to get everyone the kind of reps that they need. I hadn't even considered that. That's a yeah. Yeah. And then number two, while Sandstrom isn't certainly is not the top priority to the organization right now. Clearly, they value him enough that they're worried about losing him on waivers. So if you if you care about him that much, you're going to want him to play. And they're not going to want him to play in favor of Carter Hart, certainly, but also Sam Erson, who they like enough to have him as the backup, to have named him the backup last week. So they're going to want to get him down at some point to play. And the only way to do that is to wave him. So I have to believe that's where this is going. It's just a matter of when they feel confident enough to do it without having to worry about Tampa. And just thinking about what the Phantoms are going to be, is it the most important thing in the world to have like pretty good, uh, at least okay enough goaltending in the AHL? No, because the you know you win the Calder Cup, who cares? But it's very, very hard to evaluate guys when a bunch of shots that don't belong going in yeah. go in. Oh, 100%. Like it's, it makes evaluation yeah. so freaking much everybody more gets, difficult. Everybody gets frustrated. Everybody, it's just like, like everybody starts you, running you around. You throw up your hands. Yeah, because they're trying to protect their goalie. So, yeah. And then there's also the fact, and I do believe this, even though there's been a lot of turnover since, like, since this happened, there are still some people in the organization. I really think that so much of this is them so scared that they're at any point in the future going to relive what happened in 2018 when all the goalies got hurt. Listen, it's you would think it's a low end possibility, but here we are talking about Ryan Ellis. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> oh, risk the lion. Yeah, he's probably going to play, or we're never like. And there is absolutely no indication that Rasmus risk the lion yeah. is going to disappear forever. I am being hyperbolic. However, this is the fucking Flyers. It's fair and. Who knows? Yep. And and I think that is kind of their thought is that, hey, you know what? He's 
He's a useful pro goalie. We don't <laughs> yeah, want to lose him for nothing because if disaster strikes and we're the Flyers, disaster strikes quite often. All the time. We need backup Twice a week. Plans. Twice a week. The, the Phillies with an embarrassing cave-in loss and just something dumb happened to the Flyers. These things are like yeah. Spider-Man meme. Happens every day. Pretty much. Uh, before I just... We talk about not wanting to lose Sandstrom for nothing. What constitutes something? Like if Tampa is like, uh, <laughs> like if they it's have fair. no, if it's they fair if, if if they're in this staring contest with Tampa, and they must have some intel that's like they might pick him up, or at least they're paranoid enough to believe it. Is a fifth round pick enough to trade Felix? Yeah, I, mean, I would right? I would trade Felix Andrew a fifth round pick in a second. The thing <laughs> is that how many picks does Tampa even have? Left? They would, trade them all away. You would you would wonder <laughs> if it's in like twenty twenty seven, yeah, right? <laughs> like at this point, because they're just they've been going for it for a decade. Yeah. I'm just wondering because we talk about losing him for nothing. If they really really want this guy, what's something? I, I just I'm just curious. Like, would a seventh do it? I. I don't know. Yeah, prob- just, probably not. Probably because, not. Because, again, they're looking at this as yeah. they know Sandstrom. They want him to be in the mix. It just, to me, it's a little bit it's a little bit much because you already have Peterson as your insurance guy. Like, I don't think you need two insurance guys. But clearly, Danny Breer thinks they need two insurance guys. They had eight. <laughs> <laughs> they used eight before Charlie. It's fair. Like, and it's, it was a record, right? Yeah, like, it was I record. don't think anyone's – but – it happened and not all that long ago. So if you're looking to protect yourself, I get it. Uh, it's a safe bet that something dumb is going to happen to the Flyers at some point. Speaking of bets, <laughs> the NFL season is going strong and DraftKings Sportsbook is hooking up new customers with an offer that's even stronger. Bet five bucks on any game this week to score $200 instantly in bonus bets. And DraftKings isn't stopping there. All customers can take advantage of a sweetener offer every game day this October. Uh, This week, we've got San Francisco favored by under a touchdown in Cleveland. Miami is a two-score favorite at home against Carolina. We've got Philly favored by seven in the Meadowlands. And the full slate of games plus props, teasers, and so much more. The action at DraftKings for week six is nearly endless. Get in on the game day greatness. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code PHLY. New customers can score $200 instantly in bonus bets when you bet $5 on the NFL. That's code PHLY. Y only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino Resort in Kansas and licensee partner Golden Nugget in Lake Charles, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 160. 68 hours after issuance see sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions terms and responsible gaming resources good one it's a new it's a little new little little tweak but so i i i think i did an all right well, now job. it's ontario it's not ont well that's it's this a big one change. well yesterday i did the mlb one and it said ontario and this one still says ont but now i know, now you know that's actually what they mean right uh, all right, so we have uh, the roster as we showed you earlier, and today we talked, well, you did, uh, sure the did. assembled media, spoke with Danny Briere, and some of the quotes were inflammatory, at least the people, people got mad, which is the <laughs> most predictable stuff on the planet, Yeah, uh, people getting mad at the Flyers, but... While I think there is an element of overreaction, they're not wrong to be mad. We are being told that this is a rebuild and the priority is the kids. And then Danny says, but game one, we will have a veteran heavy lineup because that's out of respect to them, which, okay, all right, on the face of it, I understand that. I might not agree with it, but I understand it. There's 81 games following it. You know, if Nick Sealer only plays half of them and we get Andre in there, all is forgiven. Uh, But it does beg the question, why build a team like this? 
Like if you if you if if it's oh this is an important thing in hockey we have veterans so we must respect them, then why did we need more? Yeah, well, I mean their viewpoint, and again, I'm on record as saying I didn't really understand. Even though I like the player, I didn't understand the Garnet Hathaway signing. I'm also on record as saying that I didn't really understand the Mark Stahl signing either. Especially my thing was if you're going to sign Mark Stahl, you should have traded Nick Sealer. You don't need both, but you'd think not. They kept them both. That said, the way they're looking at it is with Stahl, they see him as this player coach almost. That's where they think his value lies. With Hathaway, I really think honestly a lot of it is, and Danny Briere hilariously dubbed them the PhD line. Yeah. They really think— Because of the brain power on the line. Hey, you know what? They're smart guys. (laughs) <laughs> I just don't think that's I don't think that's the acronym he was he was going for. Yeah, I, personally. I, I mean, anyway. <laughs> the way they look at that fourth line is they want that to be like an identity setting line. And again, okay. they think that that's important. That they want the team to have an identity and they want the fourth line to kind of be the line that drags people into the fight. And that's their view. Delore is a guy who they like because they think he protects the kids. He gives the kids more confidence to go out there and make tough plays, you know, do spinoramas, do fun things, gives them that a little bit more confidence. Now, again, this isn't necessarily what I would do, but this is their argument. And on the face, I don't think any of those arguments are bad. I just think that it's kind of like how many of these vets do you actually need? And that's, I get like, amongst the forwards, I really don't have a huge problem with what they're doing. Now, they have to make it a priority to figure out what this rotation's going to be, yeah. make sure Brink and Forster get in as much as humanly possible. But, like, Cam Atkinson has to play because they need to trade him at some point. So I get it. He at least has to play some so that he can establish some freaking value before they're able to trade him. I get it. Other than that fourth line, which they don't want to break up, I guess you could move one of the wingers out and put Lawton down there and then have both kids in the lineup every night. Okay, uh, but I really don't have an issue amongst the forwards. <sighs> but the defense is a totally different story. Like, it's a completely different story because it's not like what va- Sean Walker's value between now and the deadline is not going to change. It's going to be a fifth round pick or nothing. Like, Mark yeah, Stahl. It might, might be nothing unless it, you retain. Like, yeah, Mark Stahl is going to be acquired whether he plays games or not. I equated him to the year team and got uh, got traded when he didn't play with blood it, clots. It'll, it'll like, help. If, I guess it'll plays. help. I'm just saying. But getting back to the idea of pr- uh, respecting the veterans. I get it. We're going to do it for the opener. It's kind of a big night. Okay. What about the home opener in a couple of games? Do we have to respect the veterans then too? They're playing an outdoor game. That's going to be a big event, national television. Do they have to respect the veterans for the outdoor game? Uh, Stall from Thunder Bay. Do they have to, does he have to play every time they play Toronto? Like what about his against his old team, the Rangers? Does he have to play against them out of respect? Like that is the stuff that I think, oh, well, it's the opener. We have to respect the vets. Those are the questions that pop in my mind. If it's just this one time, okay. But well, again, we'll, and we'll see. It is, a, and, and, but and I get is, why yeah, people. Yeah. I get why people automatically jump to nothing's changed. It's all a bunch of bullshit. Well, well, like, well but I again, get why people this, make that jump. This is the point I made on Twitter: is that most of this is just driven by the complete lack of trust that exists between, particularly the online section of the fan base, which is. Definitely, you could argue is the most diehard. I don't know if I would quite go that far because they're the angriest. They're, well, there are probably really angry people that aren't online too that just don't know how to use a computer, but they're still very, very angry. It's just that they all work at the front office. It's, I'm it, sorry. It's just I'm that sorry. it's just that we deal with the ones that are online <laughs> yes, more, yes. and the ones that that tweet at us tend to be the most angry of the fans that are online. I gotta check my mail more. Maybe I get maybe I get like <laughs> handwritten scrawled letters oh from God. maniacs. Oh my There's God. A a lot of those that show up at the uh, legacy sports radio stations in town where people know where to send. There's a lot of handwritten letters written to this. Fair too, enough. So I, maybe we could get them. Too. I think where I'm at, though, essentially is. And I remember saying this a lot during the Ron Hextall era. I think I'm going to be saying it a lot during this era as well is I'm not going to get angry about something until there's something to get angry about. And a lot of people seem to like to get angry about something that could happen in the future. If. If we're two weeks into the season and Emil Andre has yet to play in a game, I will be critical of that. 
but I'm not going to be critical of what might happen two weeks into the future until it happens because I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to say, you got if you're going to keep this guy up, you got to play him. And if you're not going to play him, then send him down. Personally, I'm of the opinion that I don't know if I would have had Emil Andre on this roster. I think it's neat that he's on the roster because he's a cool prospect and maybe they want to work with him directly. I don't think he played well enough in camp and preseason to earn a job, particularly in the starting lineup, but probably not even on the roster either. But if you've made the decision that he is good enough to be on the roster, then play the guy. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to play him in every game. I'm not saying that, but you're going to have to play him and they're going to have to find ways to do it. Now, this again goes back to what you said about you've got three vets in Sean Walker, Nick Sealer, and Mark Stahl. Maybe you need one of them. Maybe, you know, Mark Stahl is your player coach. Maybe you even need two because maybe Nick Sealer is the secondary fighter dude who protects the kids if Nick Delorier can't play because he can't play. But do you need three? Probably not. And that's why this is going to be a struggle. It's going to be a struggle to make sure that they get all these guys ice time. And maybe this problem solves itself because guys get hurt because it's hockey. It's a violent sport. Guys start falling prey to injury. Then suddenly the kids get to play because there's nobody else there. But until that happens, this is going to be a juggling act. And I guess where I'm at is I, I, I understand the skepticism. I just, I wish people didn't immediately jump all the way to anger even though I get why, because they're just so angry at the the fact that this team has been bad for so long. It's because we so badly want what they told us to be true, but we've been through this before. Like, we were told the Ron Hextall plan was going to be a new era. And it was like, yeah, but we're still going to try to make the playoffs and do dumb shit. Like, if they really wanted to start something new, and this isn't something I was interested in at the time, but... All right, you talked Ed Snyder into we're not going to be going for it. Well, if we're not going for it, why are Giroux and Voracek here? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I don't, I, I wanted to watch those players. I'm not saying it's something I was advocating for at the time. It's just we've seen it before in terms of half measures. We've seen so many, oh, yeah, well, they're, they're going to they're gonna rebuild. They're going to do this. They're, they're committed. And then they just aren't. They don't go all the way in terms of what needs to be done to turn this thing all the way over and eventually around. I hope they can. The comments today, I can see why a fan would get mad about I, it. I want to read. I, 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 I want to read the comment yeah, read, in full. Actually, yeah, because, give us the full because I, I more or less summarize it on Twitter, and then people lost their minds. So I want to read the whole thing because give if I read part. the whole thing and everyone hears it and still is mad, that's fine. But at least I'm not presenting it incorrectly. This was Danny Briere today. I think early on, I think it's a respectful thing for the opener to treat the veterans right, but then their play will dictate who plays. You all know Torts by now. He's not afraid if someone is not performing. He's not going to hold back. He's going to play the young guys. I mean, we've seen it with Bobby Brink. He didn't think he was going to be as good as he'd been in training camp. He earned his way, and Torres is using him more and more throughout the preseason. That's going to be the same rules moving forward during the season. So that is the comment. Basically, it's it's a respectful thing for the opener to play the vets, but after the opener, play is going to dictate. Now, again... You can't just throw Emil Andre out there for one game, and then if he's not that great, say, all right, back to the minors, kid. Like, we got we to gotta give these kids a real shot. But if you trade off between Forster and Brink, you know, the first four or five games, both one guy's got three games, one guy's got two, and they both look real good, then you got to put your money where your mouth is and bench a vet to have both of them play. Yeah, that's eventually it's going to have to be both. Yeah. They can figure out a way to mix and match this, but it's going to have to be both at a certain point. Like un that's, un unless one of them just unless, isn't ready. And Yes, absolutely. Like if Bobby Brink just stinks or that's, Tyson Forrester just like, stinks, the then comment, yeah. The comment is very funny in that he just goes, we built this thing. With zero expectation, Bobby Brink would be a factor. That's exactly yeah. true. Like, that is like you just <laughs> they did look, not think like so. we talked about the roster math all along, and it's like, yeah, it looks like there's one open spot in the top nine, yeah. and Tyson Forster's taking it, and then all of a sudden, ah, shit, yeah. the guy we penciled in is being outplayed by a dude we had no expectation for. It's, First half of the season, at least, I think. I think you're absolutely right. And, and we put him when we did our pre He was on my outside looking well, in. He, but he was he was at least in the mix. I think we had him as, like, long, long shot. Which, shot. Which is exactly what he was. Get a look at him, yeah. see what happens. And to his 
He earned it. So he sure he's did. here. Uh, he looked good. And listen, if you want to look good, you got to go with Foco because Foco has the absolute best officially licensed gear for all sports and fandoms. Listen, it's football and tailgating season. It's coming tomorrow. Red October returns to South Philly. You're going to want to be ready. And guess what Foco has? Oh, they got the overalls. Uh, hoodies, hats, sunglasses, bags, anything you need for a game. Foco has you covered. And not just that, but accessories, toys, collectibles, novelty items, anything you might be you know, looking to build a podcast studio with. Foco has that as well. And they always have our backs for Philly sports. And they have yours too. Get the best gear around by using the link in the description of this show. And for all non presale items, use the promo code PHLY. That's promo code PHLY for 10% off. Foco, get your overalls. Get your overalls. <laughs> all right. So <laughs> the offense is, is one part of this. And I really don't care that much. I think there's a way to make the forward thing work. Hope so. When I look at this defense, I'm looking at Sean Walker specifically. He's got five years in the league. He's played 232 games. Is he really a vet worthy of the respect in terms of ice time consideration? Like, he's just some guy out there. He, it's This isn't, listen, Mark Stahl is a, a 15-year veteran in this league or whatever the hell it is. He's been around forever. Uh... I get it. Okay, yeah. Player coach, he's going to be in a leadership role, longtime veteran. He's worked with Tortorella forever. Okay, I can accept it. Sean Walker, like we're talking about Sean Walker. <laughs> I just do not understand. I, I, he turns 29 a month from Friday and has 232 games in five years. That's an average of 46 a season. That's not a veteran. That's just some dude who plays well, sometimes. So he... he he was pretty good in L.A. He got hurt, then he kind of fell out of the mix. I'll put it this way, Bill, and I'm kind of preparing you for this. I get the sense that they like Sean Walker. When we, when I asked, actually it wasn't we, it was me. When I asked Danny Breer near the end of the of the availability today, which, which veterans at camp impressed him? The first guy he said was Travis Sanheim, which cool. I think we all saw that, that he had a good camp. He looked really good in quite a few of the preseason games. Another guy he mentioned was Sean Walker. And then John Tortorella today basically pointed out that you guys in the media don't talk enough about Sean Walker, but I think he had a strong camp. I think they like, number one, and again, this is a very hockey man thing, they like the fact that he's right-handed because they like that so many of their young guys are left-handed and that they hope he can sort of be like the partner maybe for Andre or Zamula. If I had to think of, what, like, the, and this is just me reading the tea leaves, I think if there's one guy who's who's might be the first de veteran defenseman on the outside looking in, it might be Sealer. Because if you don't, if you remember, like Sealer was the seven going into last year, he had a good. And he year. worked his way yeah, in. Yeah, he had a good year. But I get the sense they are more excited about Walker. I think they respect Sealer, but I would not at all be shocked if Sealer's the first guy that comes out of this lineup for an Andre. Because they like the idea, I think, of of making it as easy as possible for the kids by playing on their natural side with a right-handed shooting guy. And we have a uh, we have a graphic for the lines that they used in uh used at practice today and one must assume that this is a pretty good representation of what game 1 on Thursday will look like. Yeah, I think so. Ristolainen status notwithstanding, of course right now he's on IR and you can see he's paired with Andre which would leave you to believe lead you to believe Emil Andre is going to be the odd man out for the opener. Uh, I just, this lefty righty thing, Charlie. Um, really drives you up the wall. <laughs> Charlie, in 2010, Chris Pronger, Matt Carl, Brayden Coburn, and Kimo Timonen had one thing in common. All left handed. All shots. left handed. They played the entire fucking game, and the team went to game six of the Stanley Cup final. And if not for a garbage man playing in the net, they probably could have won it. Who cares? I truly do not understand well, why this is such a big I'll deal. I'll tell you who cares. NHL it's, coaches. It was, this was like a few years ago. They had nothing but lefties, and they like went out of their way to go lefty righty on every pair. Which is because Elaine Vigneault really wanted it. And it's. I get like wanting to have it even if it makes sense. But right now I'm looking at this thing and it doesn't matter right now. Sure, play whoever, get the lefty righties because that's some sort of advantage for you. 
if this is how you choose who plays based on the curve of the stick, not who's best at hockey, not who the best guy for these minutes is. Like in a playoff game, it's like, well, we would really like to get Andre a few more minutes, but we already have three lefties. So uh, he's going to be on the bench a lot. And we're just going to play someone who happens to have a stick curved the other way who isn't as good. That's asinine. Well, yeah, you're not it, picking the best players. Yeah, but I don't think it's I don't think it's that Walker like right now Andre is out of the lineup presumably because he might be the seventh best defenseman. Yeah, That's, right. But I think if anything, it's more about development. It's more actually probably about the kids if that's the route they take. Because, like for example, we looked at what with Cam York when he came up. Cam York has made it very clear he prefers to play the left side. Now, can he play the right? Sure, played the right for most of last year. But now they're looking at it as he is going to be developed, be developed as a left-handed shooting defenseman, left side defenseman, because that's what he prefers, and we want to try to get the most out of him. So let's play him over there. Another guy who was obsessed with the idea of always being on his natural side, Ivan Provorov. So they had to develop him as a lefty shooting defenseman. Now, does that mean that his partner has to be a righty? No, but if you if you have guys who are adamant about playing one side or have an increased comfort level, it doesn't hurt to have a righty. Like if you're choosing between if if Andre is going to be in the lineup and you're choosing between Nick Sealer and Sean Walker as the other defenseman on the third pair, maybe it makes sense to go with when like. Who's better? Who knows? They're, they're more or less the same dude. Maybe Nick Sealer's a smidge better. But if playing with a right-handed shooting Sean Walker has the potential of making Emil Andre more comfortable, I get it. I get it. So I hope that it's not blocking a kid. But I do understand why it's a bonus in Sean Walker's like arsenal that he's a righty. We have so many, like we could put him with, with some mold if we don't want some mold to play the right. Why not? Plus with Risto out, Walker literally is their only right. He's shooting the, defenseman. Yes. So look, it's, it's going to play in, in the grand scheme of things, guys like Sean Walker, guys like Nick Sealer, as much as I like him, they're not going to be part of the future. So their presence has to be all about how does this further the development of the kids who potentially could actually matter. And if Sean Walker's right-handed status makes him a better partner for one of the kids, then sure, play him over Nick Sealer, play him over Mark Stahl. This is why, uh, and you know, I was fine with the Mark Stahl signing, but if it's just this, okay, well, we have this guy who can only play this side, and this is where we want all of our defensive prospects to play, that's that's a dumb sign. Well, yeah, like they did a yeah. bad job with that sign. No, and, and, and again, this is what I talked about at the beginning of the show with the defense core is that they just have too many bodies. Like that's the problem. They have too many third pair bodies. Like I I question whether they would have maybe they would have anyway because he was a salary dump. Maybe they just had to do it to get the Prover off deal done the way they wanted and get a first round pick. But like, do they? Do they ask for someone different than Sean Walker if they know that Mark Stahl is going to let them know that he's willing to come to a rebuilding team? I'm not sure. Do they trade Nick Sealer? Like, to me, I, I did an article at the beginning of the summer breaking down, this was when I was still with The Athletic, breaking down who I thought they should trade. And I, I graded it according to, I think, like five different categories. I ranked them all one through 10. And Nick Sealer was one of the guys who was in my bracket of like, they should trade this guy. And a lot of it was had nothing to do with Nick Sealer, the player. It was that he had a good year, he's on a cheap contract, and they need to clear up spots. And instead of trading him, maybe there wasn't a market. I don't know. Or maybe they just didn't work to try to trade him. But to me, Nick Sealer is the kind of guy, like, you talked about You talked about on the show that, well, what if, like, November rolls around, could they just trade Cam Atkinson? To me, like, Nick Sealer is a guy who maybe, maybe you could do that. Maybe if a team has a rash of injuries on defense. He's so cheap. He's so cheap. And and somebody, rather than scouring the waiver wire, you're like, hey, give us a fourth round pick and we'll give you Nick Steeler because we need to move. We need a spot cleared for Igor Zamola to play every night. That to me is the kind of trade that could actually happen in the first half of the year because you like <clears throat> in a way that like a Walker trade isn't going to happen because no. of his cap hit. So they they have a log jam on defense. It's a problem. And it's and we're going to see if they can find ways around it in the short term. But eventually, they're going to have to deal with it. And I don't think the solution here is just wait until the trade deadline. They got to get these kids playing that time is way early, too earlier far than away. that. Like, I can see, I can understand, like, with some of the forward, again, with the forward log jam, that's going to work itself out with injuries and trades down the way. But, like, the defense thing, 
Uh, just looking at these pairs, like York Sandheim, cool, dope, yeah, that love works. It. Awesome, way to go. Stall Walker. All yep. right, so here's 20 minutes of ice time that are absolutely pointless yep. in terms of building the future yeah, like of this what's, team. What's the point here? There's, that's, yeah. If this yeah, whole season is about the future of this team, there's 20 minutes. That, that's a whole period of every game. Pointless. Zamula Sealer? Okay. Yeah. Sealer, some value. Zamula, potentially the future. And then Andre and Risto are that uh, fourth pair, the, the presumed guys who aren't going to play Thursday. We'll see how that all works out. But just... You got a lot of you got some waste of time in there, and that is very, very frustrating. It is Charlotte. frustrating. Yeah. You know what shouldn't be frustrating though? What's that, Bill? Buying tickets to your favorite events, and that's Great. why you got to use the game time app. That was that just happened. Was I solid. didn't even mean to do well that. Uh, <laughs> buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and the best price guarantee, you can stop stress over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. Game Time is the place for last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the, to the day of the event. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section in a row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code PHLY for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code PHLY for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right, so we've... I think effectively done the bitching and complaining that people won't now. Like, we're not being chills, right? <laughs> like, that's... I, I think we have put did, out... Did I, did I tell you about how, I think it was like three days ago, someone on Twitter yelled at me... And, for being a corporate chill, yeah. No, it was no, very no, funny. no, no, even oh. better. No, he didn't yell at me for being a corporate chill. For what corporation? He, I wouldn't He yelled at me for being a corporate shrill. Shrill. Ah, so that's, good. Oh, that's and, what and it was. And it was just like, okay, if you're going to insult me, at least spell the word right. <laughs> Pick the right word. <laughs> Like you clearly, like, do you know the difference between a shrill and a shill? No, no. I, I I found that very. Funny. That was that was good. <laughs> but there is like while the we're I mean we're gonna be as on the like you know on the ground in the weeds as you can get. We are going to five days a week. Yeah, baby. we are going to yell and bitch <laughs> about every roster decision if someone doesn't get enough ice time, even though they're out there. Listen, that's that's. What we're doing this year, it's about developing these young We've guys. We've talked about it. The, yeah, this like, is going to be the constant debate. This is the debate. point of this season. Getting these kids playing uh, time and finding out what they just are. Just the idea that some of these kids made the team is uh, is really cool. So I, I want to start out with Bobby Brink, who you know picked an NHL number. He's not going to be you know one of those kids out there in a weird number. He actually grabbed number 10. Sure did. Uh, you know, long time. Number 10, John LeClaire with the organization. Uh, he did not credit Mr. LeClaire sure for this decision, though. Didn't even credit Brayden Shen. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot Brayden Shen wore it, quite honestly. Uh, he he credited Lionel Messi. That is yep. his, uh, yep. that's his inspiration and then for Rockin' 10. The best part about it, too, is that this is it's such a, like, and I'm not that much older than Bobby Brink, but like he's very much of like the, the younger generation to me. And his explanation was because someone asked him, "Well, have you have you ever seen Messi play? Especially now that he's now in the U.S. playing for Miami." And he's like, "No, but but I, I got to know him by playing FIFA." <laughs> like, it's such a great answer, which is terrific because it's <laughs> like people are like you know Leclerc's right there. He could have said John Leclerc. He works for the organization he's, again. Yeah, like you've probably talked to him I, recently, probably multiple times. And he's a player development guy. It, it is very funny though. Like he was born one year after. Leclerc's last 40 goal season. That's funny. When he went 50, 50, 40, 40. Yeah. He was born after that last 40 goal season. He was like five years old when Leclerc retired. Wow. He has no idea who John no. Leclerc is. No. I think he's from Minnesota. Yeah. No, he's <laughs> like, no, he's like, I'm trying to think of like what the equivalent would be. Like John Leclerc to him is like Guy Lafleur is to me. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, I know him. And I've heard amazing stories about how great of a player he was, but I certainly never watched him. And it's not as if we're talking about Wayne Gretzky here. Listen, John LeClaire, a franchise legend, uh, one famer. of the greatest yeah. American. One of my favorite players yeah, One of up. the greatest American goal scorers of all time. 
he's not exactly on that. You definitely no, know him. No, tier. he's not on the, the Gila floor. Tier. Like, yeah. No. Uh, Tyson Forster, even though he's going to be, has anyone been able to talk to Forster? Are you going to get that opportunity about like making the team, but potentially not playing in game one? When's the next time the players are going to be available? Um, well, we, I, let me put it this way. And I'm, I'm not saying this is a bad thing about Tyson Forrester. I think Tyson Forrester is a good kid. Not exactly he's, a quote he's machine. He's not a quote machine. <laughs> so when we were going to players at practice, I picked Bobby Brink, oh. who gives slightly better quotes than Tyson Forrester, who it's a lot of very, it's a lot of six word sentence answers. That's good for him, man. I mean, and it's be and left it, alone. And the thing is, is that it's not, it's not like he comes off as mean. He just doesn't have a lot to He's say not, to the media. He just yeah, not not everyone has yeah. that personality. A lot of hockey players are purposefully boring, so they'll be left alone. Some of them just have no idea what to say. Yeah, like <laughs> I loved Connor Bedard the other day when they asked him, like, oh, so like he says, oh yeah, I've been cooking for myself. You know, my mom walked me through everything. I Facetimed <laughs> her. Like, so uh, what what have you been cooking? Shit, I'm going to be honest with you. This is just something I said so I'd have something to say to you. <laughs> That's I, awesome. It was not going to hold up to interrogation. Yeah. I was like, expecting a I follow-up had, here. I had one sentence. <laughs> I did not have two. And, like, at least he tried, though. Uh, Andre making the team, like, we, we got that quote from Briere on uh, – on Brink, and it was basically like, we did not think this was going to happen. He blew us away pretty much. Yeah. Anything like that from, like, listen, when I think we all got a pretty early idea that the coach liked Emil Andre. Oh, yeah, yeah. But when the most effusive praise he has for him is, dude's not afraid to make a stake, mistakes. He made a ton. Made a ton. <laughs> sure made <laughs> a lot. Like, in a, like, he's saying it in a, in, like, a positive way, but, like, the nicest thing he has to say about him. Like, is there surprise that Andre made it too? I, I definitely get the sense out of, I guess, the four, but definitely the three that are uh, that are still waiver exempt. So Brink, Forster, and Andre. That Andre is probably the one who enters the season on the the shakiest ground in terms of I'm not sure how he's going to play. We're not sure how long he's going to be up here. We're not sure how many games he's going to get. You know, if he comes in for one game and struggles, is that is that it? Does he get sent down? I think that's possible. But I was intrigued by how honestly honestly effusive Briere was in praising him because we had just gotten done talking about Brink. And then I asked a follow-up about Andre. Basically, look, when we asked Torts, Torts was open about the fact that Andre's made a lot of mistakes. What did you guys see aside from those mistakes to make you think he was ready? And the answer was, especially for those two guys. So, oh, no, so here it was. Him and Bobby Brink both made some plays and made some mistakes. But we all felt that they didn't play it safe. They just kept going after it. They want to improve. And for us, that's the best part is when you see a young player try to figure out where the limits are and what they can get away with at the NHL level and what you can't do. Especially for those two guys, I thought training camp was amazing because they realized amazing. because they realized some of the plays they can't make, but they also were not afraid to go after it and try things. And then the 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 caveat to that was, I don't know long term. I'm not promising they're going to be here all season, but they deserve to start the season because of their aggressiveness, the way they compete it, the way they make plays. We want to see more of them. So clearly they want to send a message to all the other prospects, like go for it, be aggressive, take chances because like Brink to me, did Brink make some mistakes? Sure. He made some mistakes. He had a couple of turnovers here or there, but he was overwhelmingly on the side of, he did a lot of really, really good things and made a few glaring errors that skill players are going to make. To me, Andre was like 50-50. He made like 50%. Wow, that's a hell of a pass. Like great stretch pass, really good maneuver out of traffic. And then 50% of yikes, like you don't understand how to like how to create angles in this league. You're getting beat on the rush. Like you don't understand how to deal with a four check when it's at high pressure behind the net. And for him to lump both of those guys together, number one, I honestly thought it was a little unfair to Brink because I thought Brink was way better than Andre at this camp. But he did say I did see a quote that he he like, said Brink was Brink the best was our for, best, forward best forward in, in all camp. of camp. Yeah, which I mean, yeah, that's yeah. high praise. Yeah. But I think the message he was trying to send by lumping the two of them together is not just to those two, but to all the other prospects to basically be like, this is what we want you to do. We don't want you playing it safe when you're trying to convince us to earn a spot. We want you to play your game. And if anything, we want you to make too many mistakes because 
if you if you try and if you're aggressive and if you go for it, even if you make a ton, just like this Andre kid did, if we see the upside, we're going to give you a shot. And I, I like that. Like th- these are. I think this is another reason why I struggle to get as angry as the people on Twitter are because I see so many positive signs in the in the things that they're saying, in in what they're doing. Like, yes, is it frustrating that Emil Andre might not play in Game One? That Tyson Forrester might be scratching Game One? Yeah, but. I think it's better than them getting sent down. Like, Definitely. I, I don't think the plan is to keep them as scratches for two weeks and then send them down. I think they're both going to get looks. I think they're both going to get looks pretty quick. And we'll see what they do with it. But I think having all four of Brink, Forrester, Andre, and Zamola on this roster, four legitimate kids. Zamola's maybe the only one who's a little bit of a borderline, but he's still an unproven guy who's yet to establish himself as an NHLer. To have four of those guys make the team and Sam Erson as your backup instead of just going the easy route and giving the, the job to Cal Peterson because he's got veteran presence and shit, I am i wouldn't say I'm pacified, but I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by what I've seen and not dressing Tyson Forrester and Emil Andre just for game one. That's not enough for me at least, to take away from the encouraging signs that I've seen and the encouraging things that I've heard so far at camp. What I really liked uh, from that quote was the, we want to see more of them. Because that gives me the feeling inside that this is and will continue to be an open competition. Like maybe Andre didn't show everything in camp to have an opening night spot, but he's one of our 23 best. And if he impresses us, he will be in the lineup. Yeah. We just want to see more. This is a couple of weeks of training camp was not enough to determine whether a guy's ready or not. We're going to give them a shot. And that's why when I looked at the uh, forward lines earlier, I see Brink up there with Farabee and Couturier. And it's, we're not just giving you a shot. Oh, no. We're like, giving we're you a giving shot. You, <laughs> we're giving you one C, one LW. Go get them. Like, you're not going to have to, oh, you got a little bit of defensive two-way shortcomings? Well, we put you out there with Sean Couturier, so don't worry about it. Yeah, right. Go play your game. Even if you make those mistakes, there's someone there to help cover them up. And you're going to get all the opportunity and, 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 in the world because two of our three best offensive players are standing next to you. And you know what? Honestly, I, I just kind of thought about this, but... As much as, look, we don't know how Bobby Brink is going to adapt to the NHL. Maybe he's going to be in over his head once the once the season starts. However, Bobby Brink was, in my mind, the most offensively creative player at camp. He was the guy who was making the most plays. Now, again, he had more at stake than guys like Travis Konechny, who know they have a spot, whatever. Guys like Cam Atkinson, who were just trying to play themselves back into shape. But you've got a guy in Sean Couturier who the defense is already back. He's having trouble with the offense. Maybe this is just as much trying to help Couturier by giving him a guy who, at least from the playmaking side, did the most in camp as it is helping Brink with the defensive side. I called Brink the other day, Slow Giroux. Slow Giroux. And maybe, like, I don't mean that in like a <laughs> negative like, like that. Listen, like, Drew wasn't exactly a burner, but no. I think he had a better wheels than Bobby Brink. I would Brink. agree. I would agree. Uh, but Sean Couturier has had offensive success in his career. With one line mate, that line mate is Claude Giroux. I don't think. I mean, okay, he, he had his, uh, his most offensive success. He had offensive su- success without Claude Giroux. He had some. This is the okay, best though. he the best he looked. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, the best he looked was with Claude Giroux. I would agree with that. Give him one of those offensively gifted guys and let him do that thing that he does. Be in the right place. Yeah, that's Sean Couturier's number one asset is being in the right place. Yeah. Bobby Brink can find him. Yeah. That's the hope. Yeah. I, and I think, it, you know, I'm expecting Katuri to be rusty to start. He was rusty in camp. Even John Tortorella, a couple of days ago, we asked him, what were your thoughts on Coots? And basically he said, look, he's not where I want him to be yet, and that's fine because I can see the progression, and I think he's working his tail off to get to get back to being the player that I remember him being. But I don't think he's going to be that player to start the year. And if having surprising. a passer like Bobby Brink helps him get there a little bit quicker, then great. If it doesn't and Brink looks overwhelmed and Couturier therefore is completely invisible because they're spending their entire games in the defensive zone, it's easy. Bring Forrester in. Maybe you put Forrester with Couturier. Maybe you move Konechny back up with Couturier, who's a guy that uh, the Couturier has played well with as well. There's a lot of options here. And you know, you talked about a few shows ago about feeling like 
this team might be better than you think. I'm not there, but I will say that on the forward side, look, the thing this forward core lacks is high-end talent. They lack superstar guys. They're obviously hoping that Mitch Koff and Cutter Gauthier can be those guys in the long term. In the short term, they don't have them. However, they do have a lot of good forwards. They have, they have a lot That's, of good forwards, and they have a lot of young guys who could also be good forwards. And what that does is it does give you a lot of interesting possibilities in terms of combinations and trying to figure out who complements who and what pairings might work. There's there's upside here for, for some of these lines to be pretty fun. Now, it, it's maybe not exactly, but this the forwards remind me of um, last year's Seattle team. Now... Matty Beneers broke out, and it's yeah. like, okay, maybe he's higher upside. Yeah, they had a couple like, other guys. They had some guys who yeah. stepped up, but really, it was like four second lines. Like, that's what we we called them that, and it was funny because it's, you know, Dave Hackstall's team. Yeah, right. uh, But, like, it's maybe not everything up here, but good depth that they're going to be able to come at you in waves that, okay, yes, we... Uh, I guess we can't say four second lines with the fourth line what it is, uh, but three second lines. I, I would say that I don't think this forward core, assuming it's that assuming that Couturier is is back at some point back to what he was before, or at least ninety percent of what he was before, and let's say the same thing with Atkinson. I don't think this forward core is dramatically worse than Seattle's from no. last year. I just think Seattle's defense was a lot better. Oh, that's, <laughs> and that's the we big get thing. to the defense, and that's what's gonna two things are gonna hold this team back. And it's, one, young players, what do they struggle with most? Consistency. Right. Even if you're great, you're going to have stretches. To you're going to you're gonna lose confidence for a week. Uh, things are going to happen because young, young players always need to find consistency. And, two, the blue line is bad. Yeah. It it's, is not good. It's scary. It's scary because we talked about Mark Saul, Sean Walker, Nick Sealer. Like, they all might be decent players, but if you if you have a good blue line core, you don't want all three of them starting for you. That means that half your defense core are third or third pair guys. They're not winning you any games. Yes. And like Ristolainen is at best a four. Travis Sanheim, when he's playing his best, is a three. Last year he played like a six. Cam York, we still don't know what he is. Like this defense could be its ceiling is okay. Its floor is oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> which honestly either outcome is acceptable either some guys are better than we think yeah or the team's terrible and we get a top three pick fair point like, either of these things i think are acceptable outcomes <laughs> all right now it is time uh, as we're wrapping up charlie it is time for our hypothetical of the day all right uh, and this one got this one got pushed back a little bit but looking at the players who could be due contracts soon guys in the last year of their deal mm -hmm. say only one you can extend would you do Tippett or Hart? Now, I believe Tippett would be the easier one to do, but really this is a question of if Carter Hart says, I want to be here, because that's going to be the big question. How long do you want to pay a goalie for if you're rebuilding? And does he want to go through a freaking rebuild? Yeah. If he says, I want to be here and makes that commitment to you, like when uh, Holmgren went up to Mike Richards and says, what do you see yourself doing in 13 years? I said, Paul, I want to be a flyer. He goes, are you serious? Because, and puts the contract in front of him. <laughs> if he says, I want to be a flyer, do you give Carter Hart eight right now? No, I, no. I don't. I don't. I, you know, num for a lot of reasons. Number one, because I do like their goalie pipeline. Number two, I'm terrified of giving a goalie that, that long of a deal. I really am. I mean, obviously, we're not going to get into the Hockey Canada stuff, but that to give him that contract you would have to know that he was not involved and is not going to be disciplined like yes. that that's a four that would be that, that's an assumption yes you're not but that's, gonna, that's the hypothetical of the hypothetical yes, yes he has to be either nothing ever comes out or actually clear yes if you're gonna give him that kind of contract there has to be some sort of resolution exactly but to me there's enough I have more concerns over whether Carter Hart fits in this long term than I do about Owen Tippett, in large part because I would try to lock Owen Tippett up to a deal that's kind of not an eight-year deal, but maybe something like a five- or six-year deal where you get him until he's 30. And hopefully, you know, the final two, three years of that deal, you're off to the races. And yep. then you make a decision. 
and when he's 30. Of, okay, is he still good? Do we have to give him a contract we're going to regret? Yes. Well, <laughs> but, because, because but we're, we're cup contenders? Exactly, like, exactly. Because who cares about when he's 36 if you can win a cup now? Exactly. So, yeah, I, I like that plan. I, that's, if, yeah, to, to me, what you, Tippett would be my guy. If you could extend, like, say he starts the year, Owen Tippett starts the year and looks like Owen Tippett from the second half of last season. Mm -hmm. Cool. You doing it in November, December? Like, would you do it right as soon as possible? Yeah, I would. I would start negotiating. I mean, obviously, this is the problem with the Sanheim deal, where they negotiated a year early and didn't get a discount. Like, yeah. the thing is, if you're negotiating <laughs> early, you're presumably doing it, especially when you're negotiating with an RFA, because it's not like there's any real rush with a UFA. I get it, <laughs> but like with an RFA, like Tip, it will still be. You get him under contract early, you're you're taking the risk that what if he gets hurt? What if he drops off? So if they're willing to sign a deal that gives maybe gives the Flyers a little bit of discount, whether it's in terms of years or in terms of money or both, hell yeah. I'd look into it. I think Owen Tippett, I mean, I don't think Owen Tippett is a guy who is going to, just based on his track record, unless he just storms out of the gate this year, I don't think he's going to need an $8 million a year contract. But I think he's going to, you know, if it looks like he's a legit goal scorer, yeah, if he's a 30 goal scorer, he's going to get paid. And I don't have a problem with the Flyers paying him. I look forward to seeing how that unfolds. And I look forward to seeing all of you on Thursday for the opener, our very first pre- and post-game shows. Uh, we will be off tomorrow because there will be a pre- and post for Saturday's game as well. So make sure you tune in for all of that. But off Wednesday, Thursday's the opener. I will be in Columbus, for Charlie but I will be calling in. Charlie traveling, so that makes being off Wednesday a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charlie, because I bought Phillies tickets for Wednesday. Didn't want to have to do a show that day. Going to start drinking pretty early. Love so that good for you. So good work on your travel day. Uh, that is all the time we have for you today, however. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for hanging out. If you haven't already, you got to hit that subscribe button. Search PHLY Flyers wherever there are podcasts. Subscribe to the YouTube. Do the whole deal. Go to allphilly.com. Read Charlie's articles. Become a diehard member. It's uh, going to be worth it. I promise. All right. That'll do it for us. My name is Bill Matz for Charlie O'Connor. Have a great week, Philly. <laughs>